Welcome and good morning. Um, I want to thank you for signing up for our um, series for 2013 of our Forsyth talk sessions. The session today is going to be on the Network and Store Manager. I call it NIM 101 because it will start as a basic introduction to NIM and then we've added some topics at the end um, which are a little bit more advanced. What I'm going to do is start with an introduction. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the NIM resources to make sure that you understand the basic infrastructure of NIM. Talk about setting up NIM, some client install things, and then at the end there's some hints and tips. And today I added a couple of things on backing up the BIO server and using that for NIM installs. So let's start with an introduction. And some of this, for many of you, is going to be very, very basic. But the idea is to build a foundation and move on. The idea of NIM is that it is a central point of management for installation and maintenance. We basically build all of our golden images, we have them sitting there, and we push those out. It allows us to rapidly clone LPARs and to build new ones. It can be used for LPARs, for standalone servers, and of course it lets you install software and so on. You can use it to apply maintenance, and you can also put together bundles of products. So for instance, you could have a standard golden image for an AIX install, and on top of that golden image, you could also add a DB2 bundle. So maybe for this particular LPAR, you put the DB2 bundle on. For another one, you put a WebSphere bundle on, and so on. It also allows you to install multiple servers at a time. And I can remember using them back in the mid-90s when we had an SP, and it came in with PSSP. And you could install 20 L servers at a time. It was very, very fast. You can do both push and pull installs. A push install is when the NIM server goes out and puts everything out onto the LPAR. A pull install is when you tell the LPAR to go to NIM and get everything. I tend to prefer pull installs because I have a lot more control over when they happen. I can remember asking somebody if I could build a NIM server so I could do the installs when I was setting up the server. And they were like, no, you need to do them all uh, manually. I said, well, you know, the DVD takes eight hours. With NIM, it'll take me 15 minutes for a gel power once I get it set up, and you're paying me by the hour. Needless to say, we had a NIM server pretty quickly. Uh, doing an AIX install and customizing everything from a DVD just takes a while. This way, you can build a golden image and know that every time you put it out there, you are duplicating exactly what you want. And of course, additionally, you can do alternate disk install and multi-boss and NIM clones. So once you have the basic NIM infrastructure in place, you could take advantage of some of the additional technologies that we have. There's basically three primary components. There's the NIM master, which is the actual server itself. Now, one of the things I tell people is I don't make my NIM master a virtualized LPAR. The reason for that, just as with a TSM server, the purpose of the NIM server is not just to install things, but we back things up to it so that we can actually restore them. So if your NIM server is under the control of a VIO server, then it makes it very difficult to use that NIM server to restore the VIO servers. So I always make it a standalone LPAR with dedicated resources. Its job is to own and provide the resources that clients need to store information about them, and it has its own little database. It's probably a little strange to call it a database since it's really just a bunch of flat files, but you do need to back it up and a lot of people don't realize that they actually do need to back up that NIM database. There are three different kinds of machines that we define as clients. They're standalone, diskless, and dataless. For the most part, people use standalones. Every LPAR is defined as a standalone. And then we have that you can actually define the system WPAR machines as well. In terms of networking, NIM expects to use NFS, the network file system. And a lot of people use TCP wrappers, I certainly do, to secure all the ports on their system. There's two ports that you'll have to unwrap, TFTP and BootP on the NIM master, in order to be able to use NIM. Keep in mind that um, if you have people that do security scans of your network, TFTP and BootP will raise a very big red flag. So what I tend to do is keep those commented out in inetd.conf, and at the time that I want to do something with NIM, I'll uncomment them and I'll refresh INETD. And as of AIX 5.3, we no longer use the R commands. There's actually a new shell called the NIM shell. So that's what people tend to use. So let's talk about setting up your NIM server. Your NIM server needs to be at the highest level of AIX you plan to support. This is actually one of the reasons I don't combine anything else on there like system director or TSM, 
because the very, very first system that I always upgrade is my NIM server. So right now my NIM server is at the latest AIX7, I think it's TL2 SP1 or something, it's at the very latest. And whenever a new version comes out, that's the first one I upgrade. It can still support other versions that are below it. What, it, what you can't do is support versions that are higher. And normally when a new AIX comes out, one of the first things I'll do is create a new technology level service pack for an LPP source and a spot, and we'll get into what they are shortly. I already mentioned that I use dedicated resources. I also make sure I give it about four gig of memory and a half of a core with a couple of VPs. Unless I'm planning on doing a lot of NIM things at the same time, that should be more than enough resources. The first thing that the NIM server is going to need is a volume group that has enough disk to hold all of the NIM resources. So depending on whether you're going to have a lot of Maxis B images and so on, you may need something larger. I would never put my NIM resources into root VG because you end up then with a very, very large root VG that you're going to have a problem recovering. So I create a slash NIM file system in my NIM VG, and that NIM VG is a scalable VG because it's going to get big. The other thing you'll have to do is go into Etsy security limits and make sure that you set the file size, the maximum file size to unlimited so that you're not restricted in the size of the files you can create because the files you're going to be copying in there are, for the NIM images are going to be makes us be images. I also create a separate file system called slash backups and I NFS export that to my servers. That way I can do a makes us be to them. The slash NIM file system that we're putting our resources into cannot be NFS exported separately from NIM doing it. If you, if you actually start setting up NFS exports of slash NIM, you are going to break your NIM environment. All right, so the first thing we do now is we install some file sets and any updates from technology levels and service packs for those. And specifically, you're going to install bosssysmanagement.nim.master .nim.spot and .nim.client. And those will require that the BossNet TCP server and BossNet NFS server file sets are installed. So again, you go and install those and then make sure you apply any technology levels or service packs to those so that they're at the latest version. And of course, as with all software, you can use LSLPP to check that those are done. You have to look, pay attention when you're defining resource names. NIM doesn't like dot in the name. So you're going to have to use underscore or a dash or something like that. So, you know, I might call it LPP underscore source underscore AIX53, but no dots. So at this point, you're going to put the DVD in the drive, and you're going to or point to the directory where you have all the BFF files from the DVD loaded to. Typically, when I get a new DVD, I use Smitty BFF Create, and I dump it into a software directory that I can share out. We're going to do the easy NIM version of NIM Master Setup. So basically what we're telling it to do with the command that I have issued entered here, uh, if you look here, you'll see this one here. We're basically telling it that we're going to set up NIM. We're going to take everything from the CD. We're going to put it in the file system slash NIM, which happens to be in the volume group NIMVG. Now, if those aren't there, it will create them. It happens that I've pre-created them, so they're, they're gone. Sorry, they don't need to be created. It will also create the slash TFTP boot file system, and it will create the initial spots and LPP resources in slash NIM. It will do those based on whatever the DVD is that you are running the NIM master setup against. The directory structure that it will set up will include slash NIM, and then under that, slash NIM LPP source, images, spot, Boston data, and resolve.conf. Once you've got to that point, you're going to run some LSLPPs just to check and that everything's there. So here you see the LSLPP and we're just gripping on boss this management NIM. So you can see my client master and spot are all there. Um, I did a df-g on slash NIM and you see 165 gig. Actually my NIM is now much bigger than that. I tend to keep AIX 5, 3, 6 and 7 and every technology level and service pack around. So mine is actually more like about 600 gig now. That's why I say you need to make sure that you allow for sufficient disk space for your NIM. If you look in slash NIM, you can see the resources that I had on the previous page. So you see there's a boss in data, there's an LPP source. The one down the bottom, the spot spot, is because I misnamed something, so I ended up with a spot in the wrong place. And so just showing you again on a different system with it cleaned up a little bit. 
uh, this is on 6.1, not 7. So then we go and we check out the network setup. One of the things that NIM insists on is that the names of all of the hosts that it's going to manage resolve. I normally put them in Etsy hosts. So I also go and I check that my inetd.conf is correct. You'll notice that I'm looking for the boot P and the TFTP. This is only on the NIM server. And as I mentioned earlier, for security reasons, I tend to keep them commented out. I do like passing those security scans. And then I uncomment them and do a refresh. So let's talk about NIM resources. The first thing we have is what they call machines. And a machine could be a physical machine, and it could be an LPAR. Since in the power world nowadays, everything's an LPAR, even if you have all of the system resources in it, you can assume that a machine is just an LPAR of some kind. It's basically the client. The LPP source is a directory that's going to contain all of the images AIX uses to load software. Under LPP source, you will find that each version and technology level, etc., that you want to define would be in a separate directory. And they would have a NIM name that refers to that. These are basically the BFF images that the AIX installation CDs and DVDs have. We then have what's called the SPOT, the Shared Product Object Tree. That is actually created from the LPP source, except for in the case of a VIO server, where it is actually created from the Makesys B image of the VIO server. And we'll talk about that further on. That spot's used in a similar manner fashion to the boot images and installation scripts. So it, again, is created one for each version and maintenance level that you want to be able to support. So if you want to support 6.1 TL5, Service Pack 1, and 6.1 TL8, Service Pack 1, those will be two separate spots. And then lastly, the makes this B. I can basically take a makes this B of a server, or I can take um, I can create a makes this B image, and I can then use that to actually install other instances. So what we can do is load that makes this B into slash nim slash images, do a def definition of a makes this B resource, it then becomes something we can use.